First try. Oh, I can't walk over there. So it is a honor for me to be able to take the pulpit while Pastor Todd and Tammy are away. And I don't know about you, I have been loving the Gate series that Pastor Todd's been on. If you haven't yet read Nehemiah, I would encourage you to go and read it. It's a short book, got so much in it. Got a lot in it, doesn't it, Lori? You know, even if you, even if you read it for the history alone, it's great. For me, the, the lesson it gives on how to deal with the lies of the enemy, the way Nehemiah responded to Sambalat and Tobiah, I just, I cheer as I read it. Um, those of you that have heard me speak before know that I, I love the Old Testament. I really believe the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the, New, is the Old Testament revealed. And everything, every scripture, every point means something. So I'm going to begin today, I get to talk about the beautiful gate, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson, but everything means something, and God has allowed all of that to tell us something today. So I want to begin by showing you a blank screen. Oh dear. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, those of you that have been to Israel won't recognize this picture of the beautiful gate. Because this is a picture as the gate would have appeared in Jesus' day. When you looked on the eastern gate, which is the other name for it, you would have maybe been coming in from Jericho, from the Mount of Olives, coming down and over the hill, and you would see Jerusalem in front of you. And you would see this huge wall with all the gates, with the beautiful gate right in front, and right in line with the beautiful gate, you would see the temple. And the temple, people talked about it around the entire empire. It was a sight to behold. It was the, the last one in Herod's day was covered with gold, so it reflected sunlight as people came in. So I want to give you a little bit of the history because, again, nothing is wasted. Everything means something. The first reference we have in Scripture to Jerusalem is with Melchizedek. Um, after Abraham went and rescued Lot, uh, he, he took all the spoils back and he paid a tithe to Melchizedek, who was the king of Jerusalem at the time. That's all we're given. But that is around 2100 B.C., we know from excavation, Jerusalem was there in the pre-Canaanite times. It, it is a, an old city. The uh, next really cool reference we have is of Abraham traveling with his son Isaac to Mount Moriah to offer up a sacrifice. And Isaac wondering, where's the, the ram? What, what are we going to be, what are we going to be sacrificing? And Abraham saying, God will provide a lamb which is a beautiful picture of Jesus coming. Mount Moriah is the spot that became the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The next reference we have is in David's day. There was a horrible plague that slept, swept through the, the land of Israel, killed thousands upon thousands. And it was right up to Jerusalem. And David prayed, and, and it stopped. And in order to offer a sacrifice, he bought the threshing floor of Aruna. It was a threshing floor. It was a high place where they threshed out the wheat. He went and bought it, and that was the place where Solomon ended up building the temple. Mount Moriah, threshing floor of Aruna, King Solomon's temple. The first solid bricks and mortar um, place to worship God. So now we're up to 960 BC, right? I've, I've put the scriptures on here. I want you to be able to follow through with it uh, later if you want to. Unfortunately, not all of the people of Israel obeyed God the way that they were supposed to. And it wasn't very many generations later that the Babylonians came in and destroyed the temple and hauled off an awful lot of, of the people of Israel to Babylon through Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C., but as predicted by Jeremiah, Nehemiah came back, and Nehemiah, Ezra built the temple, Nehemiah built the, the walls. You can read that in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. 
just as, as Jeremiah predicted it would happen 80 years later. And the new temple, everybody will tell you it was a sad reflection of the first one. They didn't have the money, the willpower, or the oomph that Solomon had, but they wanted the place again to worship. There's been, there's been a continual presence. And then there was Herod's temple. Wow. <laughs> Herod, uh, he kind of had a thing to prove. He was, um, just for a lot of reasons, he wanted to build this temple and put his name on it. And he built, rebuilt Jerusalem beautifully. His walls were incredible. The temple was more beautiful than it had ever been. It was covered in gold. It was the pinnacle of what was happening in the known world at the time. That was in 18 BC, and that was the temple that Jesus would have seen and would have worshipped in. Um, the next, uh, sorry, a clicker, you know? It's always fun. The next thing that we read in the scriptures, uh, specifically, we read about Jesus being in the temple throughout his life, but the one that all of us really know about is his triumphal entry to, uh, to Jerusalem, just days before he was crucified. It was the Passover season, it was the 10th of Nisan, and he came in down through, uh, from Bethphage, down over the Mount of Olives, through the beautiful gate, into Jerusalem, and he actually spent four days teaching there before his crucifixion, where they could examine him, see who he was. That was the temple, Herod's temple that he would have entered. Jesus told them, he said, I've mourned over you guys, but Jerusalem's going to be destroyed because you have not listened to the prophets, to the teachings. He told them, he said, not one stone will be left unturned. And when you look at history of what happened when Titus and the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in, 19, sorry, in 70 AD and totally destroyed it, like just went in and People were killed. The place was trashed. The temple that was covered with gold, somebody got a fire going, of course, and the fire started licking up the gold, and the gold started melting down all those beautiful stone walls. The cedar was destroyed, and the gold leaked into all of these great paving stones of the temple courts and all across the Temple Mount. And the Roman soldiers saw this, and they started getting huge crowbars, and they turned over every stone to get the gold out. So Jesus' prophecy, not one stone will be unturned, was fulfilled to the letter. They turned over every stone to get the gold. They didn't do it to fulfill prophecy, but they fulfilled prophecy in doing it. It's really interesting to me that from 70 AD until 1948 there really was not a presence of very many Israelis in the land they were dispersed completely lots of it due to Paul's persecution but due to the Romans coming and and destroying things and that dispersion caused Christianity to go throughout the known world if it hadn't been for that persecution and dispersion, Christianity might have stayed in Israel. But because of it, it went everywhere. And then the Lord started gathering them back in. And throughout the 1800s, you saw um, what they called Zionists, who came back to the land of Israel. They started buying up swampland, basically, and reclaiming it. They started planting orchards and, and growing. And, and then came the Second World War and the Holocaust. And you can read the books, but it all came together in May of 1948 for Israel to become a nation again. And for the first time in recorded history, Israel was a, na a nation again in 1948. In 1967, after the Six-Day War, Israel got all of Jerusalem. And there are some poignant pictures that you can see of the Israeli soldiers coming into Jerusalem going to the Wailing Wall and weeping because they hadn't been able to go there. It had been under the Arab control until then, um, all of Jerusalem, and they weren't able to go in and worship as close to the temple as possible. So the history of Jerusalem 
It's, it's an incredible thing. But what I look forward to, we are told that the temple will be rebuilt in the end times, and unfortunately we're told it's going to be defiled, but then we're told Jesus is going to come again. So watch Israel. Whenever you're wondering what's happening in the end times, watch Israel. That's a bit of the history of Jerusalem. I, you needed to hear that to understand the beautiful gate. So again, remember, the beautiful gate is the one gate that faces right into the Temple Mount. You come in through the eastern gate, you come in through the outer court, the inner court, and you're at the temple entrance. One of the really cool places that we are referencing the beautiful gate in scripture is Peter and John in Acts 3. They were told that they're coming in to the temple to worship, as was their custom. And some people had brought in a lame beggar that they brought in every day to beg at the beautiful gate, because it was right as you came into the, to the temple. And as he's almost settled, Peter said to him, look at me. And he looked at him and he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And that lame man who had never walked, he didn't walk, he rose up and he, it says he was walking and leaping and praising God. They could not get him to stand still. He was jumping all over the place. He had never been able to enter the temple courts. And he is walking and leaping and praising God. It's a beautiful picture of what happens when you encounter Jesus. Everything is healed. The other scriptural reference to the Eastern Gate that we're all really familiar with is Palm Sunday. It's the 10th of Nisan, and it's got a very strong historical significance. All of the lambs for, past, for sacrifice in the temple were raised in the fields right around Bethlehem. In fact, the temple had official temple shepherds that worked in the fields around Bethlehem, raising the, the lambs, making sure they were looking for the perfect one. Because you weren't allowed to offer up any old lamb. You couldn't take the one that had three legs or was lame or you know, just wouldn't obey. It had to be perfect, right? It had to be without spot or blemish. And so the, the temple uh, shepherds at Bethlehem regularly brought sheep to the temple, and they came through the sheep gate, which Pastor Todd talked about a few weeks ago. But on the 10th of Nisan, there was a very important sacrifice uh, sorry, on the 14th of Nisan, there was an important sacrifice called the Passover lamb. But the lamb had to be observed by the people and the priests for four days. So on the 10th of Nisan, it was brought into the temple. So on this day, on Palm Sunday, the high priest would come out of the temple courtyards and would start walking out and up the Mount of Olives to the meeting point from Bethlehem. The chief shepherd would bring that one-year-old lamb that they had been watching perfectly, and he would come down the very short distance from Bethlehem from the north, and they would meet somewhere around the Mount of Olives with this perfect lamb, and the high priest would bring this lamb down the Mount of Olives through the beautiful gate into the temple to be observed for the four days until Passover. So on the 10th of Nisan, Jesus is with his disciples at Bethpage, and he says to them, there's a man with a donkey, go and get it. If he asks, you know, why are you taking it? Say, my master has need of it. And he gets the donkey, and he gets to the top, top of, of uh, the Mount of Olives, and he's riding the donkey into Jerusalem. And the people in front of him are laying down their cloaks and laying down palm leaves and shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was prophesied by Zechariah. You can read the whole account in Matthew 21. But I want you to know, all the people of Jerusalem, they were used to going out there on the 10th of Nisan to wait for the chief priest to bring the Passover lamb in. The Spirit of God took over them when they saw Jesus coming in, and they recognized or began to recognize the Passover lamb. 
on the 14th of Nisan, three in the afternoon, as the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, Jesus gave himself up for the sins of all, the perfect Passover sacrifice. But he was recognized on the 10th of Nisan when he came through the beautiful gate. Everything means something in history. This is Israel. Bethlehem is super close to Jerusalem. And some of you are making the connections that Jesus was born in, in the main sheepfolds of the temple shepherds as the perfect lamb. So this is the picture I showed you earlier that a lot of you don't recognize, but I don't recognize. I've been to Israel. <laughs> because when, when um, Herod's, or sorry, Titus's people, the Romans, destroyed the original walls and everything else, it was a shambles, right? It's stone, but it's still a shambles. So then as different ruling people started coming into Israel, and the Ottomans were one of the main ones that did a lot of rebuilding, the Crusaders did some, they rebuilt on the original gate. So if you want to see the original beautiful gate, you have to go several feet under the existing walls. In fact, the only existing wall they figured that was close to the temple is the Wailing Wall, which is why so many um, people go there to pray. But what you would see today, oh dear, did I do something wrong? Um, I want to go back, okay, I'll skip, you'll see it. I'm going to show you a picture of what it looks like today. But I may have problems here because, um, okay, I'm just going to skip forward. Forgive me if you're watching the overhead, but it shows how good I am with the overhead. So this is the gate that those of you who have been to Israel see today. You come over the Mount of Olives, and it's like, <gasps> it, the, the wall of Jerusalem, it's unbelievably beautiful. But that gate, it's walled off. It's the only gate into Jerusalem that you cannot enter. Not only is it walled off, there is a cemetery in front of it, an Arab cemetery. <laughs> so you're not going in there at all. So I want to give you a little bit of, of why. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I think this is where we find out that sometimes uh, overheads are interesting. So I do want to tell you, though, that there's been a prophecy I'm going to back up. You're going to see, well, there. You're going to see that again. It's prophesied that um, by both Ezekiel and Zechariah that Jesus, in the end times, is going to come back through the beautiful gate into the temple. And it's, it's a known prophecy, obviously. I will tell you. The enemy reads the Bible as well as we do. He knows what's prophesied. So he had a good talk with a few of the Arab leaders, and he said, make it so that Jesus can't come back through that gate. Well, I'll tell you, the best way we can make it through, so Jesus can't come back through that gate is we'll wall it off. We'll put a bunch of cement there. We'll plant a cemetery. No good Jew is going to walk through a walled-off cemetery gate, right? But the Lord said in Zechariah that on the day the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west. I can tell you when the Mount of Olives splits in two from east to west, that cement will be gone, that gate will be gone. <laughs> I... I sound a little bit sarcastic, but the idea that cement at a cemetery could stop the king of glory from coming in when he says he's coming in is truly laughable because Jesus could walk through walls if he wanted. But I serve the God who is in charge of the wind and the waves and the earthquakes and the mountains, and he can say to a mountain, be moved. So I know that when he says that the Mount of Olives is going to split in two, pretty sure the gate's going to open also and the king of glory is going to come in so this is what the muslims did just in case you want the history to it um, the east gate was closed down and then some of them walled it a little bit 
and uh, you know, over the years, they tried different things, but it was really Suleiman the Magnificent in 1500s. Uh, how many feet of, of uh, cement does it say he put in? 16, 16 feet of cement. This, this is serious, right? So here's where I want to talk to you about what the significance of all of this history is. We've got this gate here. It's walled off with all that cement. There is death planted in front of it. And God's saying something to us. To begin with, he's telling us that there are gates into our life. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And those gates into our life he wants to be able to come in as the king of glory, to bring joy in, to enter in and, and be able to come in and bring us the joy and peace that he created us to have. And the enemy of our souls, he wants to put cement and death in front of that so that joy cannot come in. So I, I want to give you a few ways that this has happened. I'm actually trying to find the time because I'm very aware that we are also um, streaming online, and I want them to hear it also. Let me start with a broad one. In the last hundred years or so, all of our kids have been taught in school that the Earth kind of came from, depending on the theory, maybe a meteor hit, maybe there was an explosion out in the galaxy, something like that. And anyway, you know, there's death, and then some slime crawled out of a puddle, and the slime became something else and something else until it was monkeys, and then eventually there was people. And it's, it's, a, very, it's a very difficult theory because it changes regularly. But what it's done is it's taken out, you have a loving creator God who created this incredible universe, created the earth, created everything in it, created you. Now, how is this a gate? boarded up, filled with death? Well, if I believe I'm descended from slime, monkeys, the Big Bang, pick one, I have no worth, I have no future, I'm just here and then I'm gone, right? But if I know that I am here because the God of the universe wanted me to be here, he knit me together in my mother's womb, he formed me. He knew me before I was born. He created the world. I have great worth. I am a child of God. I am intended. So which one is the better truth to come into your soul? You're an accident. You're worthless. I don't know how you even happen. You were created. You were destined for glory. God's got a purpose for your life. Don't, don't let the enemy... Keep that gate there. Here's another one. God said to us, I've created you to, for man and wife to leave their parents, join together as one, live, procreate the earth. He had so many plans for marriage. The enemy today says, ah, it's a piece of paper. You don't need that. Marriages don't last very long. You're better off just doing what you're going to do. Don't worry about whether you're married or not. You don't have to have just one person. Life is short. Live it up. And all those lies against marriage and parenting and the family have left all this brokenness. God wants to come into your life with joy, with peace. He wants to show you his plans. And when we live under the lies of the enemy, we get the death. We get the cemetery. We get brokenness. I choose life. I choose truth. There are so many lies in our life that the enemy is putting in brick by brick by brick. Maybe he's telling you, you know what, <laughs> you're really not important. You're not worth anything. Nobody's going to listen to you. Maybe he's using this stupid COVID to bring you fear. You better be afraid. You're going to die. You're going to make someone else die. You can't go there. Don't get too close to them. Don't give them a hug. Heaven forbid you should hug people and show them that, that love and care. I believe 
Jesus knows the date of my birth and the date of my death. He knows how I'm going to die. I don't know if I'm going to die by a meteorite or COVID or car accident or old age or if I'm going to go up in the rapture, but I know God knows. And so I'm not afraid. And do not let COVID seal off the gates of joy in your life. You know, I'm not telling you to be stupid. I'm not telling you to be a denier. I'm not telling you any of that. I'm telling you, do not live in fear. You cannot, because fear is a lie of the enemy. Joy, peace, glory. That's what God wants to bring us. There are so many places the enemy wants to come and build a wall, or build, uh, brick up a gate, plant death in front of it, so that you cannot come into his temple with singing, Hosanna. I want to tell you, talk to Jesus. He wants to break down those lies, bring you absolute truth, and take you in with glory and joy and singing. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. That song you sang about the king of glory coming in, Hosanna, was amazing. Uh, as are all your amazing songs, of course. <laughs> but I... I want you to know this is something every one of you can do on your own, and this is something if you can't do on your own, get somebody to come alongside you. There are so many of us would love to pray alongside of you to break down those bricked up gates and let the king of glory come in with joy and peace into, the, into your temple. So history is there for a reason. God, he's got so much for you. Hosanna to the king.